Shalom, shalom, shalom. Again, Maria Alicia Israel of the House of Israel, bringing you truth or traditions. Today we're going to talk about something very, very controversial. So I want you to call all your friends, all your ministers, all your bishops, all your elders that teach Sunday school and Sabbath school and tell them to listen and learn. And if indeed I am in error, as many of them say that I am, then have them called in the 749-1230. And we won't hang up on them. We'll listen to their points of view. Because the scripture said we are indeed our brother's keeper. And if I'm in error, then it's your responsibility to correct me and other members of the House of Israel. And even if I don't acknowledge it, there might be people in the House of Israel that hear you and say, hey, what they're saying makes good sense. So don't be hesitant or reluctant in asking any questions about what I'm teaching. And also I want Brother Wells to call back in because he called in the other day and he asked me a question and I, and he was cut off before I had a chance to address all of his concerns. So if you anyone know that beloved brother, Brother Wells, tell him to call in and then I can continue to answer the questions that he put forth. But right now I'm going to let everybody know that my lines is open tonight for your opinions and your questions. So I'm here tonight to answer any questions at all pertaining to salvation. I'm not going to take all night to tell you uh, who's Methuselah's great grandmama because that's not relevant to your salvation. But if you got any questions that pertinent that are pertinent or relevant to your salvation, don't be hesitant or reluctant in calling in. I want to address all of your concerns. I want to address the concerns the other ministers refuse to talk about. I want to deal with them. But tonight I'm going to open up and deal with a subject called Did Christ Die for Our Sins? It started uh, about three or four weeks ago. I had a visitor, uh, General Yohanna from uh, New York, leader of a large Israelite organization there, but he's what we call Messianic. Even though he's an Israelite, he's an Israelite that believed that Christ is the son of the Most High, the only begotten son. He believes that Christ is the Savior of Israel, but he said he'd go along with the whole New Testament. So if he goes along with everything that Paul says, then there are some things that uh, he says that uh, actually are contradictory to the Almighty's law. And we're going to discuss them today other brothers and sisters that say they go by the whole Bible. First of all, if you go by the whole Bible, then you have not yet found out that the Bible is a book that contradicts itself. You have not yet found out that Yah has not endorsed the Bible. You have not yet found out that Yahweh never mentions to his people to read the Bible at all. He told them to read the book of the law. And the Creator mentions that the book of the law is finished. It's complete. And He told them to seal the book. So if the book is in fact sealed, the book of the law and the prophets are sealed, then we don't have no room for any other book called the, the Talmud or the Quran or the Hadiths or the New Testament or any other books that are contradicting the words of the true and living Elohim. And that's in fact all these other books do. Let's explore one of the things that's mentioned in the New Testament. Many people believe that Christ has died for the sins of Israel and indeed the sins of the world. They believe this because this is what the New Testament says. And by them not knowing that a man named Marcion wrote the New Testament, 
and that this man was a man that hated Yahweh and hated the children of Israel, they have not yet found out all of the various things about the New Testament. So they think this book came right out of the sky from the Most High and that it was blessed and sanctioned by the Most High. And believe it or not, as long as they've been reading the scriptures, they don't know that the New Testament is a total contradiction of the words of the true and living Elohim. Let's give me, let me just give you a, a couple examples. Now, if the whole book was written by Yah, there wouldn't be any contradictions. Because Yah said, I am Yahweh, I change not. The sun changed, the moon changed, you and I changed, the weather changed, but Yahweh never changes. Now, why doesn't he change? He doesn't change because Yah said he is perfect and he said his laws are perfect. And in fact, if his laws are perfect, and we're going to read that to you there, you'll find it in the book of Psalms, the 19th division. And I believe we want to look around the seventh verse. And what I'm saying, if the laws are indeed perfect, then Yah don't need to replace it with any laws that could have been made better. And incidentally, all these other laws that they will tell you that's in the New Testament and the Quran that are better were actually inferior to the laws of the Most High. They're all inferior. I would, I would dare to, to, to venture that I don't know anyone that would try to compare these laws, laws by laws, because Yah's laws are fair. They're just and they're equal. Not so with the laws in the other books. But let me give you a few examples of how you'll find these contradictions. In the book of, uh, for instance, in the book of Deuteronomy, if you hold that page of Psalms 19, you'll find in Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, that it says, perhaps around the second verse, it reads, Ye should not add unto the word which I command you. He said, Ye shall not add to the words which I command you. Yah said, Don't add to these words. That means no more books, folks. That means no Talmud. That means no Quran. That means no to New Testament. Because Yah, when he established and gave the laws to Moses, which both the Quran and the New Testament acknowledged that he did, then he told Moses to leave the laws in his book alone and not to add anything to the book. Neither shall ye diminish out from it. And he said, neither shall ye diminish from the laws of Yah. Don't diminish at all. Because in diminishing, it will affect the perception of the law. In adding, it would corrupt the perfection of the law. So we're not to add nor dimension, diminish. And then the Creator said in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, the 13th chapter, around the 32nd verse, I believe, he tells them something similar in the 13th chapter. The Creator tells us that we are not to add nor to put anything in the law at all other than what's in there. And you find this in Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, the 32nd verse, it says, verse, it says, What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou should not add thereto. Thou should not add thereto nor diminish from it. Nor diminish from his law. And why? Why? That's when I told you to go to the book of Psalms 19. It says, verse 7, The law of Yahweh is perfect. It's perfect. If it's perfect, brothers and sisters, believe me, it cannot get any better. 
there's no need for you to say, baby, you cooked a perfect cake, but I want you to do this to it the next time. Uh, the next time you cook, I want you to don't add so much sugar. Uh, you put too much salt. Uh, you didn't use enough butter. If you make those statements, that is a recognition that it was not perfect. Because if your wife, in fact, cooked a perfect cake, there's nothing that she can possibly do to make it better. And if Yahweh gave us perfect laws, then there's nothing that anyone can do to perfect that which is already perfect. You can't do that. And here we have in the New Testament people contradicting the laws of Yah. For instance, in the Old Testament or the Holy Scriptures, Yah says that we're to keep the laws. Well, I'm going to show you tonight that the New Testament says you don't have to keep the laws of Yahweh. You're under truth and grace. I can show you that Yah said you must be circumcised. I will show you the night where Paul said, circumcision profits nothing. And whoever is circumcised cannot profit, and Christ cannot profit him anything. That he's indebted to do the whole law, and he has fallen out of grace. Isn't that a terrible punishment for a man to just merely try to do the right thing and a woman trying to be a do-right woman and now because she tried to be a do-right woman and her husband tried to be a do-right man now they are cursed they are ostracized they're cast out because now you 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 committed a carnal sin you tried to do what was right and that's what the new testament will project as I will show you tonight, the Creator said, don't eat any unclean foods. The New Testament said you can eat anything at all. Yah said that, uh, that a, a man that's a Nazarite is not to cut the, his hair as long as he's under a vow of a Nazarite. The New Testament said it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Yah said that a man is to obey him. The New Testament says a man is to obey Christ. Yah said that his chosen people is Israel. The New Testament said there is no difference between a Jew and a Greek. Yah says a woman can teach. The New Testament says a woman is a shame for a woman to even ask a question in the church, less long attempt to speak. So here and there and everywhere you will read these contradictions. Well, a contradiction that I want to share with you tonight is a great contradiction that is being taught that Christ has died for the sins of Israel or the world, either one. And I'm going to show you that according to the laws of the true and living Elohim, that Christ cannot die for any man's sin. Or no other man, as a matter of fact, can die for any man's sin. And how do we know this? Because this is a law. It was carved in stone. If we look in the book of Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, the 16th verse says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Now, this is a law. This, these are the words of the true and living Elohim. Now, why did I bring them out? Because Yah said, let every truth be established 
by the mouth or of two or three witnesses. Let every truth. And I'm going to establish this truth by the mouth of four different witnesses. Now, the people that believe in the New Testament, they're supposed to do the same thing. Because in the New Testament, if you read uh, 1 Thessalonians around the 5th chapter, the 21st verse, it says to prove all things. Now, I want my Christian brothers and sisters to prove from the mouth of the true and living Elohim, prove from the mouth of Yahweh that he said someone could die for another man's sin. In other words, the mere suggestion of that would prove that Yah is a contradiction. The mere suggestion of that will prove that Yah is not stable. And he'll say something one minute and change the next minute. And we can't rely on his birds because he will say one thing to Ezekiel and something else to Timothy. And one thing to Moses and something else to Paul. And his words are not reliable. Well, the Creator wanted us to know that his words are beyond reproach. That there is great liability in the words of the true and living Elohim. That he is very responsible for everything that he says. And when he says something, that that is forever. If we go to the book of Ecclesiastics for a moment, the third chapter. <clears throat> Notice what the 14th and 15th verse says. It says, I know. It said, I know that whatsoever that whatsoever Elohim does it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. For Yah does this that men can fear before him. In other words, the Creator wanted you to respect him, acknowledge him, reverence him, and believe, believe that he's totally reliable and responsible for everything that he does say. And he says no man can die for another man's sin. And it said whatsoever Yahweh says, it shall be forever. Nothing that Paul or Christ or Peter or anyone else says can diminish it. He said nothing that Yah said or nothing anyone else says can diminish his words. And he said nothing can be what? Can be put to it. Nor anything taken away from it. Why? That's corresponding to the law. Don't add. Don't diminish. Don't add to his words. Don't diminish. This stands on its own. And then Christ is alleged to have said in the New Testament that the scriptures cannot be broken. Christ is alleged to have said in Luke 16 and 17, he said <clears throat> to the law, not one tittle shall anywise be taken from the law. Not one thing, he said in Luke 16 and 17. And it is easier. He said it is easier for, easier for heaven and earth to pass. And I agree with him. That's one thing I agree with him with. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass. Than one tittle of the law to fail. Than one tittle of the law to fail. So Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, the 16th verse will stand on its own merit forever. And when you read something in these other books that's a contradiction of that, then tear it up. Because I assure you, it's not established in truth. 
It's not established by the words of the true and living Elohim. For, as a matter of fact, Yahweh does not even speak in the New Testament. There's not one place in the New Testament where the creator of the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that therein is ever said one mumbling word to anyone at any time, anywhere within the confines of the New Testament. So don't say that you're trying to learn about the Most High. I know they got a bunch of passages in the New Testament that says the Lord, but you got to understand the Lord does not mean Yahweh. There are many lords. Uh, in Europe, they had Lord Frankenstein, Lord Rochester. Abraham was called Lord. Lord just means master. So merely because you see Lord, that is no by no means suggesting that that's talking about the Creator. It is not. And here you see the Creator says nothing can be put to his words. So that means that Deuteronomy 24 and 16 has to stand. Furthermore, if you look in the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, Isaiah, the 40th chapter of Isaiah, if we look at the 8th verse, it says, the grass withereth. The grass withers. The flower faded. And the flower will fade. But the word of our Elohim. That the word of our Elohim shall stand forever. That means throughout eternity. That means from everlasting to everlasting. That means perpetual. That it is unending, unceasing, that his words are forever. And his words said, no man can die for another man's sin. Let's get another witness here. It says in the book of Exodus, the 32nd chapter, I wanted you to read this because this is a place where Moses, who was most beloved of Yah, and Yahweh said that he know Moses personally. Let me show you the kind of relationship that Moses had with Yahweh. A relationship closer than anyone that you ever read about in the Holy Scriptures or the so-called New Testament. You read where Christ went and fell on his knees three times and prayed to Yah, and Yah never answered him one mumbling word. But who is Moses? And what kind of relationship did Moses have with Yah? You find in the book of Exodus, the 33rd <clears throat> chapter. Notice what it says. I believe in verse 11 it says, In Yahweh. Spake unto Moses face to face. And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Say that again. And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And you know how man, it, it went into vivid detail explaining how Yah spoke to Moses. He said in the same manner that you would speak to your friend. And that's not with a veil over your face. That's not with your hands covering your face. That's not uh, with you on the other side of the building and you yelling out to them. That means you're looking eye to eye, speaking mouth to mouth. And that's how him and Moses used to communicate. It even said one time when Moses had a brother that was a prophet and a sister that was a prophetess. They began to speak out by, to Moses because they figured well, they were teachers just like he was. They were prophets and prophecies just like he was. And so therefore they thought that they had the authority to try to correct Moses. And if Moses and Yahweh wanted to correct Moses, he would have corrected him. Because he knew him on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis where he comes down and just talk to him 
as you talk to your friends and relatives. We find in the book of Numbers, the 12th chapter, that Aaron and Marion began to speak against Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. Now, they wasn't upset with him because he married a black woman because they themselves were black, just like Moses were, just like all the children of Israel was and is to this very day. For the scripture said, uh, an uh, Ethiopian cannot change his skin, and neither can a leopard change his spots. And if Israel was once a black nation, there are and still a black nation until this day. But nevertheless, they began to talk got against Moses. But guess what? While they were speaking against Moses, guess who heard them? Yahweh heard them. Now, why did Yah intervene? Because Moses was so close to Yah, he came down and let them know the type of relationship that he has with this man Moses. He said, let's start reading in Numbers of the 12th chapter, the 12th verse, the first verse, so you can get everything. And Miriam and Aaron. Spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Have Yahweh indeed spoken only by Moses? Have he not spoken also by us? And Yahweh heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was more meek according to the scriptures than any man on this earth. And Yahweh spake suddenly unto Moses. He heard what they were doing. He heard that chitter chatter. And he came down and said. And he said unto Aaron, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. <clears throat> and Yahweh came down in the pillar of the cloud. And stood in the door of the tabernacle. And called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet amongst you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. My servant Moses is not so. I don't speak to him no vision and no dream. He wanted to deal with me and got a quest for me. I come to him. Here's what Yah said. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all my house? In other words, in all of my kingdom, in all of my sacred house, there is no one as faithful as Moses. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. And he comes down and he says, With him, with Moses, will I speak mouth to mouth? Will I speak mouth to mouth? Not so with Christ, not so with Paul, not so with Peter, but with Moses will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of Yahweh shall he behold. Wherefore, then, were ye not afraid? I can see why you weren't afraid of Christ. I can see why you weren't afraid of Peter, but Moses, the most faithful man in all of my house, someone that I come and talk to face to face, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of Yahweh, does he behold? And you had the audacity to speak against him, speak against him? So you know what they'd have did if they had grabbed hold to him like they did Christ. Because Yah, when he said something, he means it. When he said, touch my, my anointed and do my prophets no harm, he meant that. That's the reason he closed the mouth of the lion when Daniel was in the lion's den. That's the reason he didn't allow the fire to, to touch Daniel's three companions, Hananiah, Mashael, and Azariah whose name was changed to Shadrach, Midshach, and Abednego. Yah closed the fire and closed the mouth of the lion because these was his anointed. And he said, you see how personal this man is with me. 
Why would you speak against him? And the anger of Yahweh. And he was upset. Was kindled against them. And he departed. And he departed. And when he left, you know what he did? He cursed Marion. And what did he happen when he cursed her? And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. She turned white. So, you know, she had to be black in order to turn white. If she was already white, the Almighty would have cursed and turned her white. This was a sign of his indignation. This was a sign of sin. And he cursed and she became white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have seen. Let her not be as one who is dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh, saying, Heal her now, O Elohim. In other words, I just wanted you to see how intimate a relationship that Moses or Moshe had with Yahweh what type of person he was, and how close Yah guarded him. He didn't even allow people to speak to him. People smoke, spoke against him and had their whole family just swaddled up by the earth. Hole just opened up and swaddled up all the people that spoke against him. That's the type of man we were dealing with. And when he died, notice what Yah said about Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, the 10th verse. He said in the book of Deuteronomy, 34 and 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel. Hello, now Christ is known as a prophet. And the Creator said, there arose not a prophet in Israel like unto Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. Now I dare anyone to call me up and even show me one place where Yahweh ever spoke to Christ at all. Show me one time when he came to his defense. One time when he punished people for speaking against him. And you're going to say died for your sin. Well as great as Moses was, guess what? Moses thought that he was so great since he knew of the beautiful and wonderful and marvelous relationship that he had with the Most High that Moses thought he could die for the sins of the people. He thought he was that man. And look what Yahweh told Moses when he tried to die for the sins of Israel. <clears throat> we find in the book of Exodus, the 32nd chapter. I believe I want to go around the 30th verse. We're going to start there. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. Ye have sinned. In other words, what is the great sin? There was one sin called the great sin. And I need you all to pay attention to what the great sin is because my Muslim brothers and sisters are committing this sin every day. All of my Christian brothers and sisters and relatives and friends and acquaintances are making and committing this great sin this very day. The sin is called the great sin, the horrible sin, the sin that's known as an abomination is the worship of anyone or anything other than Yahweh anything and notice what happened and it came to pass on the morrow that moses said unto the people ye have seen a great sin and now i will go up unto yahweh peradventure i shall make an atonement for your sin in other words he thought he could step in and make an atonement for the sins of the children of israel and moses returned unto yahweh and said Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and I've made them gods of gold. 
Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. In other words, Moses said unto Yahweh, Forgive the sins of your people Israel. And if you don't forgive them <clears throat> for my sake, then blot me out. Let me die. Not only let me die, not only take me away, not only ostracize me, but blot me out of the book of life. Erase my name. And look what Yahweh said to him. And I want you all to take note of this. For the scripture said, wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore get ye wisdom. But with all you're getting, get understanding. Notice what Yahweh said to Moses. Moses said, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. In other words, the Almighty is confirming the law. He's very consistent that no man shall die for another man's sins. And that's consistent. And then Yah said unto Moses, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. <clears throat> Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. He said in my day of visitation, when I come to visit, I'm still going to visit their sin upon him. And notice what happened. He did. The next verse says, And Yahweh plagued the people, because they made the calf which Aaron made. Hello? This is how I can serve the true and living Elohim. I know he's just. I know he's fair. I know he's equal. And I know his commandments are fair. So let's establish this through one more witness. The Creator said, Let every truth be established out the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let's see what a prophet, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, let's see what Yahweh told that prophet, and if he has the same revelation of prophecy that was given unto Moses. If we go to the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, the 20th verse says, The soul that sinneth. The soul that sinneth. It shall die. It shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Then it repeats, The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Hello? Yah is fair, he's just, and the, thing, and the thing that he has on Christ and any other gods that you're worshiping is, Yahweh is living. He is the living Elohim. That's why you should fear him and fear him alone. He, above all the rest of the gods of Egypt <clears throat> and all the rest of the gods of the land, he has the distinction of being a living Elohim. Even Christ acknowledged that Yahweh is the only true and living Elohim. 
Even Christ had to acknowledge that. Because Yah allowed the wicked man, when he wrote this book, he made sure that any book that's made on the face <coughs> of this earth will make him the supreme being. He made these other books acknowledge him as the master. Notice what it says in St. John, the 17th chapter. Notice what J.C., the Christ in the New Testament, is alleged to have said in John 17, verse 2 and 3. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And then he said, notice what Christ is supposed to be saying in red letters. And this is life eternal. In other words, this is eternal life that they may know thee. He's praying and acknowledging Yahweh. He said that they may know thee, the only true God. The only true God. The only one. Which means that any other God is a false God. And if you, in fact, worshiping Christ, as most Christians do, because Christianity is predicated in the worship of Christ, that you are not serving the true God. You're serving someone else other than the true God. Right now, some of you all are a little confused. Or you're saying, my brother Alicia, I know you're saying that Nobody has died for anyone else's sin, but isn't Isaiah the 53rd chapter suggesting that somebody else can die for another man's sin? Well, brothers and sisters, we are finna get into Isaiah the 53rd chapter and see if this is in fact a contradiction to the words of the Most High, or if this is just merely brought by a lack of understanding about what this is truly saying. We're going to examine this. But before we embark on this, we will go and talk to two of our brothers and sisters who call, and I would like to invite anyone in with any questions or comments to call us now at 749-1230, the buzz. And I want you to all know also that I'm on YouTube. All you have to do is type in Alicia Israel, E-L-E-S-H-A, Israel, Y-I-S-R-A, E L then listen and see my programs and lectures on YouTube. And we also have a website that got many of our recordings on it. It's called www.houseofisrael.org. And again, Israel is spelled with a Y in front of Israel. Y I S R A E L. But before we get into Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, Let's talk to one of our brothers and one of our sisters, Brother Tyrone. And yes, I want you to have Brother Wells to call in because he wanted to ask me something last a few weeks ago, and I he was cut off accidentally. And I want that beloved brother to call me back so I can address all of his concerns. Right now, we're going to Brother Tyrone. Brother Tyrone, how are you? Good. I'm doing good. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Uh, enjoying your program again. Uh, you're right on point as, as usual. Uh, I just want to make a quick point, uh, and also I want to make an appeal uh, to all the, uh, you know, Christians, uh, the uh, apostolic people, the preachers, and the bishops, is to really to research uh, the history uh, of this. Uh, what I want to do is make a quick point and... Um, uh, just move on in, 
links to your program. What um, what we know as in history, Alicia, is that uh, J.C., and I really don't want to get into what his name really is, uh, J.C., he was a revolutionary, just like a, uh, just like a Martin Luther King. Uh, now, if it sounds like I'm reading from a script, uh, I am. I wrote down what I wanted to uh, uh, get my point across. That's quite all right, and that's so very good. I don't lose my train of thought. That's now, good. Like I said, he was he was a revolutionary. Uh, he led a revolt against Rome. Uh, he taught that uh, he led the revolt for the people to not believe in the pagan gods such as Zeus, Athena, and so on. Um, therefore, uh, Alicia, he was denounced by uh, the aristocrats. Uh, the priest, he was denounced on many sides. So now Pontus ordered his, crucif his crucifixion. Uh, now, uh, therefore, a uh, few of his followers, as in his disciples, spread the word that he had overcame death and been the resurrection. Now Christianity began. Uh, it begins as a religious movement. And so now Paul, right around... <clears throat> the uh, fifth century of the common era, Paul taught that... Uh, but I don't want you to teach. I just want you to answer questions so I can address your, okay. your concern and get on with our lesson. Okay, that's, that's, I okay. know you're reading yeah, the dissertation, but go ahead. Your very important question. All right, go ahead. So now, uh, Paul is now teaching that uh, J.C. has come to uh, save the world uh, from sins and all the humans. Uh, my question, uh, Alicia, is that if we are to be uh, baptized in the name of, of J.C. and the Father, the Son, who are they named? And who gives us authority or who gave authority to be such a family? Well, first of all, thank you. And I'll uh, go ahead and hang up and listen to you. All right, thank you. All right. I, first of all, I appreciate your calling, Brother Tyrone. I'm always glad to hear from you. Now I address the various concerns that you brought forth uh, about him being a revolutionary. Uh, the uh, only knowledge that we have in, of him is in the New Testament. There's no other book we can read about him at other than the New Testament. And if the New Testament is false and inaccurate, that means the stories that they wrote about him were false and inaccurate. I never read that he was a revolutionary trying to overthrow the government. Uh, matter of fact, the New Testament, at one time he says, uh, uh, give uh, Caesar what belongs unto Caesar and give unto God what belongs unto God. And he taught that uh, you turn your other chick and that you love them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, I don't think Rome would have uh, resented him. I don't think Rome would have wanted to kill him but, uh, for his teachings because his teachings were actually supportive of their system. Matter of fact, they would have wanted to protect the man teaching to, to love your enemies and love them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Uh, they would have loved the man teaching that uh, uh, man hit you one cheek, turn you the other. If a man take you to the court and sue you and take away your coat, give him your cloak. And if a man compare you to go with him one mile, go with him two. I think they would have loved a man saying, resist ye not evil. I think they would have loved a man teaching that uh, give Caesar the things that belong unto Caesar and the Yah the things that belong unto him. Or God the things that belong unto him. So I didn't see this revolutionary teaching that would have made them want to hate him and want to destroy him at all. And uh, so, uh, and as far as his baptism is concerned, baptism is something that was made up by a group of Israelites. You had five main sects or four main sects of Israelites years ago. Around that time, you had the uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zelocks, and you had the Etsons. And he was a member of the Etson clan. And this clan invented 
baptism as a way of initiating people into their sect. And John the Baptist was in that sin. So uh, that's all I can tell you other than according to the New Testament, he's supposed to die for our sins. And I'm showing our listening audience that that is totally, total contradiction against the words of our Creator. And I finna show them something that would make them think just a little harder. But before that, I'm going to address someone else's concerns, and then I'm going to deal with Isaiah the sixth, 53rd chapter and about Christ dying for our sins. But if any brothers and sisters want to call in, 749-1230. But let me go to Sister Deborah for a minute and see if she have any comments. Sister Deborah? Hey, Shalom, Marie. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. How I'm are you? I'm just listening. Uh, but since you got me on the line, I just want to tell you how uh, much I appreciate the program and that you're taking your time and making sure our brothers and sisters know, I mean, because we are so, um, so Christianity and Islam is so, have been so ingrained in us. It's so nice that uh, you are um, showing us so we can... Um, check it out ourselves and to come over and start, you know, researching and, and learning and, and uh, turning back to the Most High Yah. I just want to thank you for a wonderful uh, program, and I'd like to continue listening. Oh, you may. And uh, we don't want you to leave. Thank you. And thanks for your comments. They were very gracious. Well, let me deal a little more with this subject. I was bringing to our attention how great Moses was. But let me show you something again in the book of Exodus, the 32nd chapter, before we get into the book of Isaiah. According to Exodus, the 32nd chapter, I want you all to put on your thinking caps here. Notice what Moses is to have said to our Creator in the 32nd verse. He told Yah, if you won't forgive, he said, read that, my friend. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Not that time. Why didn't Yahweh intervene and said, Moses, I, I love you more than anybody on earth, as I've said throughout the book, and I, you're the most faithful servant that I ever had on earth, and I appreciate you wanting to die for the sins of the world, but my son, I have a son named Christ that was already formed in heaven before the creation of the earth, before the foundation of the earth, and his main job is to come to earth and die for it the sins of the people. So you don't have to die for that sin because Christ has already died or he will die in the future for the sins of all mankind. So just chill out. Why didn't y'all tell him that? Y'all didn't mention nothing about Christ because there is no Christ. Y'all didn't mention nothing about his son named J.C. because that is non-existent. Yeah, I never spoke a word to or about this person to anyone at all, period. But what Yah did say, and I want you to write it down in your book of understanding. Yah did say, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Whosoever had sinned against me. Now, some of my brothers and sisters, they have been misled because they thought that Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, was in fact suggesting or saying that someone else died for our sins. And they get this from noticing the fifth verse says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes are we healed. That said, brother here is showing you that Yah allowed his son to die for the sins of the earth. Well, the only people that would even think that is someone that does not know Yahweh. And I do. So I know this is not true. Because I have identified myself with the words of the true and living Yahweh from beginning to ending. I have studied his words intensely and very diligently. And that's the reason I can say right now that Yah does not kill the righteous for the wicked. Matter of fact, uh, none of the prophets even thought that he did. And let me say two things to you right here about this chapter. The scripture said, let every truth be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. And you can find that, I believe, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the 19th chapter, the 15th verse, let every matter be established at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now, this is the law. Now, if you think that Yah is saying here to Isaiah that I'm going to kill someone for the sins of the, of the wicked people, then show me somewhere else that says that. Stop. Let me show you the book of uh, Genesis, the 17th chapter. <laughs> Because Abraham knew that Yah is not like that. Abraham knew the law. And knowing the law, he knew it was far from Yahweh to ever take a righteous man's life for the sins of the wicked. He knew that would be far from Yah. And if you turn to the book, of Genesis 18, we're going to start reading uh, at the 23rd verse. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He asked Yahweh, Would he also destroy the, wicked, the righteous with the wicked? Not even for the wicked, but just with the wicked. Would he allow the righteous to die with the wicked? And here's what Yah said. Preadventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Preadventure, Yahweh, there's 50 righteous men in the city of Solomon and Gomorrah, where they're committing homosexuality. And lesbians and lesbians are all in the city, like it is in Cincinnati and other cities. And uh, what are you going to do with these righteous? Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That's what you call making intercession for the transgressions. Notice what he said. Read that again. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are within. That be far from thee to do after this manner. He said that's not even a consideration. That's nothing that you're capable of doing and that's very far from thee to do after that manner to slay the righteous with the wicked. That the wicked shall be that the righteous should be as the wicked. And that's the story they tell him about Christ. That Christ, who was a perfect sacrifice, came to have all the sins of the wicked laid upon him, and then he was going to give himself for a sacrifice and die from all their sins. Now, if he was going to die for all that sins, that meant all that sins was laid upon him. The men that raped the little bitty babies, the men that had sex with the little daughters, the men that were murdering their mothers, 
the men that were stealing from Yah, like the preachers are doing today, he said all the sins are on, on this person. And then Abraham said, this is far from thee. And then he go on and said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And Yahweh said, If I find in Solomon fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for that sake. This is what you call making intercession. Mm -hmm. And this is what the righteous were doing in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. They were making intercession for the transgressors. Keep reading. And let's get on down to the 32nd verse. <clears throat> and he said, Oh, let not Yahweh be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. In other words, Yah loved the righteous so much. He loves the innocent so much that he would rather let Solomon and Gomorrah stand with all the filthiness and all the abominations that they're committing. He said, I would rather let it stand than to destroy the righteous with the wicked. So what are the righteous doing? The righteous that were in Solomon, they were making intercession for the transgressors. They were making the atonement. They were the ones, and when I say they, when Yahweh speaks of his servant, he's not speaking of an individual, he's talking about a nation of people. Not the whole nation of Israel, but part of the nation of Israel that Yahweh calls his elect. He called them his elect, his righteous servant. <coughs> And his righteous servant will be identified in the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter. And as you will see, even though it appears to be talking about an individual, he's talking about a group of individuals. For in the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter, it says, Listen, O owls, unto me, and hearken ye people from far, Yahweh. I've called me from the womb. Yahweh has called me from the womb. I was born for this purpose. Mm. Even though I didn't know my responsibilities, I didn't know who Yah was, I was born for this horror. Yahweh called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother had he made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword and the shadow of his hand as he hid me and made me a polished shaft and his quiver as he hid me and said unto me thou art my servant O Israel in whom I will be glorified. Here Yahweh, brothers and sisters, said Israel is his servant, and through Israel will he be glorified. For certainly Israel is not glorified through Christianity. Christianity only glorifies Christ. Certainly there is no other religion on the face of this earth that glorifies Yahweh but Israel. Certainly, he's not talking about Judaism because Judaism does not glorify Yahweh. Judaism glorified the Tamut, another book that is totally contrary to the Torah, contrary to the words of the Most High. And if Judaism was teaching the truth, they would be teaching the world that we, the black man in Cincinnati and throughout the United States, are indeed part of the lost tribes of Israel. 
So the only ones that's glorifying Yahweh is his servant Israel. And he said, Then I say it, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with Yahweh, and my work with my Elohim. And now saith Yahweh that formed me from the womb. To be his servant. That's what he formed me for. To be his servant. To bring Jacob again to him. Even though Jacob, you're my servant to bring Jacob again to me, though Israel be not gathered. So he's saying the nation of Israel has not been gathered, but he's talking to an elite, elect group of Israelites saying, even though Israel has not yet been gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh, and my Elohim shall be my strength. Then Yah goes on. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. And to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. So Yah said that Israel, his servant Israel, is who he has glorified. And he said his servant Israel will glorify him. And he said his servant Israel will be his salvation unto the end of the earth. No wonder Yah calls Israel his world without end. We go to the book of Isaiah, the 45th chapter. Look what Yah says about Israel in the 17th verse. But Israel shall be saved in Yahweh. Ye shall not be ashamed, nor confounded world without end. No wonder he's saying you'll be my salvation to the end of the world because they are his world. We are his world. And the only one that he's speaking of in Isaiah, to give you a clue, if you get back to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, notice what he says in the 11th verse. he tell you who he's talking about. He said, ye shall see of the travel of his soul, and shall he be satisfied, and, he sh and shall be satisfied by his servant, by his knowledge, Shall my righteous servant justify many? For he shall bear their iniquities. And that's what we're bearing today. Don't you know if we were not in America today, that America would not be standing with all of this wickedness, with all this adultery and idolatry and witchcraft and sorcery and warmongers? and prostitutes, whores, homosexuals, and lesbians. <clears throat> the only way that Yah is allowing this place to stand is because we are in the midst of it. And as he said in 53 and 11, or 53 and 12, notice what he said, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He's not the only great. Israel is not the only great one here. I will divide him a portion with the great. And he should divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. Now, I'm going to have actually died here teaching righteousness. He has poured out his soul unto death. And he was nimbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. 
And that's what we're doing today. And to show you that he's not talking about Christ, it, notice the fifth verse. He was, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. That's past him. Christ has not even been born at this time. Notice verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Well, he's not talking about Christ. Christ opened his mouth all the time. He didn't accuse Yahweh of forsaking him. Last thing I, Matthew heard him say is, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He even accused Yahweh of being a great sinner because Yahweh ignored him. But the time is running out. Can't explain all this. And I'm not able to get all your questions and answers. But uh, next week, you can call in and study your book. And we will again deal with the same subject. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, dealing with, can someone else die for your sins? And nowhere in this Isaiah 53 is somebody else dying for your sins. Somebody is making an accession. Somebody, some of them have died. Some of them are still here. Because many of the things are present tense, but a lot of them are already past tense. And J.C. was not even born here. It's not talking about him, brothers and sisters. I will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt next week exactly who Yah is speaking of when he calls his him his righteous servant. I'm going to show you that Israel is the one that he calls his righteous servant. The elect of Israel. But right now, our time is running short. And if anybody got any questions, any comments, they can call me. Area code 513-226-7110. Or either they can uh, watch us on YouTube. Just type in Alicia Israel. Alicia spelled E-L-E-S-H-A. Israel is spelled Y-I-S-R-A-E-L. Or either go to the house of Israel dot org and watch us and listen to the many debates that I had with the various ministers from all over the world. And incident before I go, the 20th of this month, I have two ministers coming down from Louisville, two uh, our white brothers coming down to debate me uh, the 20th of this month. And we're going to get a place, and the public will be invited the 20th of this month. Don't forget that. And remind me to talk about it next week. But until next week, Yah loves you very much, and so do we at the House of Israel. Shalom.